2023 seek board meeting. I will call the meeting to order. Uh, as this meeting is being recorded and for the benefit of those who have dialed into the meeting, when recognized by the chair or for any motions or seconds, please state your name prior to speaking. Uh, please know that if you are dialed in, you may not make a motion, second a motion, or vote on a motion. Uh, it's highly recommended that this meeting be an in-person meeting whenever possible. Uh, guests or person having relevant knowledge or information may attend and speak as part of the agenda upon acceptance of the meeting agenda by the board. All other guests must be recognized by the chair before addressing the board or participating in discussion. Uh, so we'll move ahead and go ahead and do the roll call. Julie. Good morning, everybody. I will uh, start the roll call if you hear say so. And if there's silence, you'll be noted as absent. Mark Balistrieri. Here. Timothy Morris. Jeff Newding. Here. Sergeant Jeffrey Houck. Bob Terry. Here. Todd Murray. Ryan Greenberg. Richard Anderson. Brian LaFleur. Here. Kimberly Beatty. Michael Volk. Good morning, virtual from Valhalla, New York. Good morning. Alan Turner. Here. Anthony Tripp. Here. Juan Figueroa. Michael Serrato. Mike Serrato's here. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you. We're just going to check on a quorum. Tim Morris is on 90. He'll be here in a minute. So. Drive as fast as it's going to work. All right. Uh, so everybody had an opportunity to look at the previous minutes from the last meeting. I'll entertain a motion to accept the previous minutes. I'll make a motion. Bob Barry. Motion Bob Barry seconded. I'll second. Brian right. LaFleur. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Um, everybody should have received a copy of the draft agenda. I'll entertain a motion to accept the agenda. Make the motion. Okay, motion Anthony Tripp. Seconded. Alan Turner, second. Alan Turner, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, before we get going on uh, into the agenda, I wanted to go through and do some introductions um, and some personnel changes in our office. I want to welcome our new associate administrative analyst, Heather Fura. Heather uh, joins us from, she came from DOT. Uh, great addition to our OIEC team. She's going to help us get organized in teams and other applications and uh, dir work directly on the C3 and the seat board items. So I'd also like to welcome our new program aide, Joshua Colvin. Josh, you're down at the end. Also another great addition. <laughs> Uh, he's he's already jumped in and started working hard on different administrative and program areas for us and um, welcome to the team to both you guys. Um, just to keep everybody updated on other changes, we are interviewing candidates over the next few weeks for the vacant assistant director spot. So there'll be a lot more to come on that, especially hopefully will be completed by the next meeting in October. Um, in regards to seat board membership, we have a couple updates. Uh, Brendan Casey from Orange County. Uh, resigned his seat board uh, seat effective August 1st. It was a Senate appointment. Uh, we have been working on filling the vacant seat board positions. Uh, we're following up on the current applications that were submitted, and, as well as making recommendations for the additional seats that are vacant on this board. So there's going to be more to come on this in the very near future. Uh, we have some committee and working group changes as follows as well. Uh, Paul Glasser Jr. will be uh, chairing our NG911 working group. Uh, we'd also like to welcome Jason Baum and Steve Carr. 
Jason, Steve, uh, they'll be co-chairing our GIS working group. And uh, Matt Delaney will be co uh, hosting the, or co-chairing the state agency committee with myself. And he's also going to be the chair of the citizen alerting committee. Um, as everybody is aware, the last meeting we voted on changes to the bylaws and those are all the committees and working groups that we have. Um, they've been working hard. They've had some meetings already and you'll see more during the uh, during their reports. Um, so on that, we'll move right into committee reports. Uh, we'll start with 9 1 advisory Alan Turner. Hello, everybody. Uh, as mentioned in previous meetings, we continue to move forward with the. Uh, Nine one standards that remains in process, and the NG nine one working group and the GIS working group, as Director Balasari just mentioned, they're under the nine one advisory committee. But I will let Jason Baum and Steve Carr and Paul Glasser speak further on that. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Paul, you're up for the NG nine one working group. Morning, everybody. Um, we had our first meeting of an NG work group this past Monday on the 31st. The main purpose of the meeting was to reintroduce the committee, go over our, our mission, our goals, introduce myself since I'm new to the committee and new to the new to the office. Um, we reviewed some of the documents um, and then we went through our meeting schedule and then we filled a few positions. Tim Hardy from Washington County has agreed to be the vice chair of the group. And I've worked with Tim before in many projects when I was in Rensselaer County. So this is a good fit for me and him. And, uh, that's it. Our next meeting is scheduled for September. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jason and Steve, uh, either one of you or both of you, you welcome. And Steve came up from the city. So thank you for making the trip up for yeah. us. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm uh, JS. A subject matter expert for New York City and the next gen 911 implementation. So we're very interested in uh, how things are going from the state perspective. Uh, I've been with the GIS working, excuse me, the GIS, it's, it's the name changed, right? It's so, name changed, so I just want to make New York City uh, GIS working group. Um, it used to be a subcommittee for next gen 911 GIS. Uh, I've been with it about two years. Uh, we have about 40 members. We meet monthly and been meeting since 2017, just to give you a, an update on it. Uh, early on, it was a lot around next gen survey information and getting information back here. Re more recently, it's it's GIS and 911, a little more you know, wide open as opposed to next gen 911 specific. And we're looking forward to growing as next gen becomes a a bigger topic for all our counties. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, my name is Jason Baum. Um, so the previous co-chair, co uh, Jerry Engstrom, has taken a position in another state entity, and I'm assuming his place on the working group for New York State ITS. Uh, I have 20 years in GIS, including public safety, and understand uh, E911 and Next Gen 911. Um, GIS plays a critical role in Next Gen 911. Uh, at the last meeting, Jerry mentioned uh, GIS PSAP data. So I do want to show that we do have, if you can go to the next slide. So we do have uh, PSAP boundaries. It's a good, um, good starting point, and we are working to get an application so we can share that data with County 911 personnel. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we move forward, just to add on to, to all, both of these working groups, they're very important for the NG91 project. So when folks reach out to the, the counties, um, it's really important that the information you provide back is accurate as well as in, in, a, in a timely manner so we can keep moving this project forward. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge project. We all know it's a huge project. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of moving components to it, um, but we are all working together on it as a team. And we appreciate everybody's support on it. So just wanted to say that. Um, State Agency Communications Committee, uh, Matt Delaney is going to do an update on that. We uh, continue. 
<laughs> we uh, we continue to meet. Uh, we we were meeting uh, and basically trying to get a, a level from every agency of what their communication systems are. So in each uh, committee meeting, several state agencies have provided a presentation overview of their communication systems to the other state agencies. So if everyone becomes familiar, we're going to continue that with our next meeting this fall. We've got other three or four agencies on, on the agenda a presentation and we're looking at just opportunities where uh, agencies can share uh, assets, share infrastructure, maybe share new initiatives uh, as they learn about what each agency is trying or authority is trying to do. Um, we really think there's an opportunity to share and, and taking you know, some, maybe some advantage of joint projects and initiatives. So. I think you're up next to <laughs> Citizens Awarding Committee. So uh, we, uh, after having not met uh, since 2020, uh, Director asked me to uh, assume the chair role for the Citizen Alerting Committee. So uh, we held our first meeting July 20th of 2023 uh, by virtually. Um, we updated our committee contact list. We have about 45 people on that committee on the contact list. Um, I will be chairing it. Melissa Nussbaum from State OEM will be our vice chair. Updates were given by OEM, uh, ITS, New York Alert uh, Program, and the New York State Broadcasters Association. Uh, OEM uh, maintained a planning role uh, in our state's warning uh, plans, warning annex. They have the State Watch Center, uh, which is a state alerting authority. Uh, ITS runs the New York Alert Program, which uh, many may be familiar with. It's used by a number of state agencies for alerts. It's also available. Uh, to counties for their own instances for mass alerting, and that is a gate, the state's gateway into IPAWS, which is the FEMA system to get into EAS and to the wireless emergency alerts. The New York State Broadcasters Association and their uh, member stations are the participating entities for the emergency alert system, or EAS in New York. The State Broadcasters Association, in conjunction with the state and federal partners, maintains the uh, EAS plan for New York and how uh, each station will monitor for alerts, how they will test uh, EAS messages and so forth. So they're all they're all key uh, players in the uh, uh, citizen learning community. Uh, we're developing an update of the committee's mission statement, the original mission statement is from 2016. Um, it's a good start and we're gonna try to refine a little bit to really set our goals of what the uh, CAC is going to do. And then uh, we're going to uh, begin developing actual work products that we're going to we're going to work on uh, advise uh, different um, uh, things going forward on how we will recommend better you know better uh, methods for alerting uh, redundancies and secondary systems. So our next meeting is scheduled for mid October. Another thing I want to talk about on uh, alerting, I mentioned this in the past, uh, the IPAWS, which is the Integrated Public Alerts and Warning System from FEMA. This is how uh, states and local entities are able to send a, a wireless emergency alert, which is the alerts to your cell phone that go off. Uh, FEMA is, tracks the status of those uh, IPAWS tests. Every entity uh, in, in every state is required to test every month to show proficiency. The tests don't actually go out to the public. You don't see them on your phone. They go into a lab environment. But it shows that your software is working. You have logins. You know how to get into your software and so forth. Failure to test for three months in a row can cause a suspension in your alerting capability. FEMA has not been doing that. They've been uh, uh, allowing entities to, to continue to alert even if they aren't testing every month. However, they have now announced that starting September 1st, 2023, they will be enforcing the requirement. Any uh, entity alerting authority, which is uh, states, counties, towns, or cities that have, have an agreement with FEMA, you have not tested for three months in a row, you will be suspended. Once you're suspended, you will not be able to send a real alert until you get back into compliance by testing again. Um, we also see that there are a number of entities that for many years they've been expired for their agreements with FEMA. FEMA does not prevent you from alerting if you have an expired agreement, but you are unable to renew. When you, you, there's a digital certificate that has to be in place in your alerting software, and that's good for many years, but it eventually expires and you can't renew that if you don't have a valid agreement. So. Uh, what we found is that many entities, the contacts are no longer with those entities. They've retired or moved on. So we were working with FEMA to help them update that contact list. They now have a portal as well for the entities to be able to go in and do sort of self-maintenance of their accounts. 
but uh, OIEC and OEM will be doing a joint effort to contact every county and town that isn't a learning authority in New York. Uh, actually, we say here in risk of suspension, but actually we're just going to do every every county, whether you're on your ballot and learning or not, uh, just to verify that all your contact information is your primary, your secondary, your technical is all still correct. Questions? Questions for Matt? Thank you, Matt. Okay, that's it for committee. So I'll entertain a motion to accept our committee reports. Make a motion by Alan Turner. Motion by Alan Turner. Second. Tim Morris. Second by Tim Morris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, our program updates. We'll start off with uh, Phil McGee who's going to talk about grants. Morning, everyone. So right now we have the 23 PSAP and SIG formula out, and we are currently processing those. So those are on the way. We're looking to get the uh, targeted grant back in September that was just released out. The 24 PSAP and SIG formula we're hoping to have soon. And we've uh, done about over 800 million <clears throat> in funds to the counties thus far. Uh, Nicole, Ryan, do you guys have anything to add for grants? No, nope, okay. They're from our grant unit, so. Um, moving on, um, you. Yep, right into the commu program. Phil again, go ahead. Yep. So our commu program, uh, we have a few additions going on there. If you can go to the next slide, please. We've added in the CISA ECD sponsored ConL Train the Trainer course, September 11th through the 15th. That'll be out at the SPTC. Um, and we're also looking to do a couple of regional additional trainings that are in the works right now. They're not definite. Um, one, we're working with Mike Postel to do something down on Long Island for an INTD course, and we're looking up in the Adirondack region with Washington, Saratoga, Warren County to do a uh, COMT, I believe. So we're working on dates for those. Those are not solidified yet. Uh, once we have dates, we will update our calendar, push out a new schedule to everybody. Um, we're looking in the future to go to more of a regional approach because what we're realizing is that with uh, schedules and things of that nature that it's uh, difficult to have the availability for staffing. <clears throat> so amongst many of the people that attend our trainings, they work within the 911 centers, the PSAPs, and to get coverage and allow them to be able to come out to the SPTC where we've traditionally done much of our training has proven to be a challenge. So we're testing the waters with trying to go out and do some regional uh, offerings of courses. Uh, that being said, if anyone has any suggestions and or requests for trainings, please email myself or Julia or our training mailbox. Let us know and we'll try our best efforts to fulfill that. Uh, next slide. Kind of just talked about this with uh, promoting the common program. As I said, any ideas that you guys have, of course, offerings, what you would like to see, uh, what we could do better for you, please let us know. Next slide. These are our updated numbers. Credential personnel throughout the state. Uh, many of these numbers are changing due to retirements, recredentialing of uh, people's credentials. Uh, we're still kind of balancing out after the pandemic. Next slide, please. This is how many we've trained thus far. This year, we're still on pace to do 140. And with the additions of those regional offerings, um, we'll probably be over 200, actually, if we can get both of those in. So that'll be good. Next slide. That's all I have. Questions for Phil and the commune? Thank you, Phil. Uh, before we go to the 9-1 program, I just want to jump back to grants. Uh, Nicole, uh, I know the regional workshops are coming up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are preparing for our annual regional workshops. And what this, uh, these events are, it's our annual outreach to our local stakeholders, uh, grants administrators, county officials, uh, emergency managers, and first responders. And it's really an opportunity for us to involve all of our DHSES offices within, um, within the division uh, to provide uh, hands-on, uh, provides their guidance and hands-on um, opportunities for questions to come through that we can handle from the grants administrative process. Uh, we are slated to start our first workshop in Lake George. That's going to be held on September 21st. 
Our second is going to be in Buffalo. Uh, that will be on September 27th. Syracuse will be held on September 28th. Uh, then we'll be moving down to Long Island on October 11th and then to Rockland County to close it out on October 12th. Uh, we can certainly share the invite and the save the date with you, Mark, and we can uh, include this community because OIC does help support these workshops, provides that um, provides the guidance and answers any questions. We have uh, several breakout sessions that we have, so it can be targeted to specific disciplines and any of your questions. So it's really a great opportunity for, for you to meet with other local stakeholders um, and discuss some best practices and lessons learned. So we're looking forward to that, but I will share the save the date. Invites are hopefully are coming out in the next week or two. I will share that with Thank Thank you. Nicole. All right, uh, we'll move on to the 9-1 program. Uh, Paul Glasser. Good morning, everybody, again. Next slide, please. So in addition to the Next Gen work group, I've been tasked with several other projects to include the statewide 911 plan. So the office has been working on hiring a consultant to assist us. But in the meantime, <clears throat> I've been reviewing a lot of the plans, going through project meetings with the office, with the director and, and Matt and others. Um, I've been reviewing these documents. As many of you know, Brett left. And when Brett left, he left me an enormous pile of documents and plans that he started and thoughts and just things. So I have gone through that over the last several months. Um, we're in a good position. I'm, I'm pleased to report that we are making progress and moving forward, which is exciting, I'm sure. And then one of the things that came out of this, one of Brett's documents was a gap analysis. So we're meeting with, um, with, the, with the project team to review the gap analysis and start completing some of those projects so we can get the state plan moving forward. And the director has made that a priority and therefore it is my priority. Next slide, please. And then as far as the next gen project, again, we're working on the same items as I stated before, working on hiring the consultant. We've been working with the project team. We do have project meetings. Um, the team, the internal project meeting team is meeting every week. And we're going through the, the status of where we are and the roadmap and reviewing timelines and others. So there's going to be a lot of exciting news in the next few months, I'm sure. So, so yeah. All right, just uh, just to add on to Paul's report, um, we talked about a little bit at the C3 meeting last night, um, but and, and I talked about it with the with the the NG overall project, but we have a lot of data that we're going to be looking to collect to make sure we're going in the right direction and making the right decisions. So it's really important that when we send you, whether it be a survey monkey or questions or just reach out to you, uh, that you get back to us as quickly as you can and, and be as accurate as you can with the data. One of the things we found, um, and it's not a big deal, we're gonna figure out where, where the issue lie today, um, is some of the numbers coming back from the survey and some of the numbers coming back from the grants aren't the same. So there's got to be a reason for that. So we're going to figure that out and, and come up with a plan to move forward and make sure that we have accurate information. So it's real important that you come back to your counties and, and see where you get that information from or who else is providing that information and make sure you guys are all providing the same information. Um, so. That's all I had to add on. Uh, is there any questions for any of our program folks? Okay, uh, we'll move on to other updates. Uh, our consortium uh, communications consortium chair, Mr. Smith. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Director. Uh, last night, uh, at, at previous meetings, you know, we kind of reorganized the, the C3 group um, and the, the regional chairs from the consortiums, as well as bringing in a state rep was Lieutenant Morris, who's apparently stuck in traffic. Oh, there he is. I didn't see him. He <laughs> snuck in. Good. And then also the 911 Coordinators Association. Believe it or not, we're trying to improve communications. Uh, and it's worked out well. Um, it is more organized, but it's a work in progress. Everybody who participates, Alan's our secretary, um, had, wears multiple hats, but we're getting there. I think the meetings are more productive. There's great communication and conversation going on in the meeting. Won't bore you. There's a reporting process that comes back to us and to Julie and to Mark. So all the counties are reporting through the regional chairs. The conversations are excellent. The questions are asked, answers. So as chairs, we can go back to our consortiums in individual counties and help relay the message, the consistency with data, 
those different things so we're all on the same level playing field. And over the past year, it's Mark, is it a year officially or almost? Almost, almost about almost a, a year. A three weeks shy. Mark's been in this leadership position. And as far as it, <laughs> uh, the consortium chairs are concerned, and I've been in my role for over 12 years uh, in, in Dutchess County, the communication between the office and the individual counties and the regional chairs and the C3 have just been excellent. Um, they seek input. We provide it. There's back and forth conversations. Not everything is that we come into 100% agreement, but we have really good conversations. And Mark and his staff have done a great job in making sure that's taken place so we can put the residents in New York in a best position. You know, we look forward to that relationship continuing. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. As I said at the first meeting when I sat here, I, I inherited a great staff. I, I just, there's been some changes, but great improvements and additions to our team. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do any of this without them. So. Kudos to OIEC staff. Uh, next report would be uh, Dave Pat, Mr. Pasting. Good morning. All right, I'm going to go through a, a number of things, and I'm going to get to some an issue that become a problem. All right, the nine Safecom has had a nine one working working group. We're working on a cybersecurity resource hub. That's under development, and it's basically when I get hit, what do I do? That's under development right now. The P25 working group is doing link layer encryption, and a GPS white paper will be re released soon. Something that's come up in the last year, or year and a half, extreme weather. <clears throat> We're working on a product that will cover extreme weather impact and extreme cold impact on communication systems. Hopefully that product will be out within a year. ICAM, identity credentialing and access management, especially as it comes to data sharing and the like. If there is standard, and who's going to be the gatekeeper? Right now, we're leaning towards DOJ being the date gatekeeper as far as granting access and credentials. NIMS and functional guidance for ICT is out. It's available. Time U is going to be changed. More positions are going to be added, more task books, and bring it up to date. It's now going to be underneath ICT, as will ITSL and cybersecurity. Part of the NIMS process, though it's a branch, the incident commander can always raise it to a section if it's determined to be necessary. The AR, ARRL is now a safe com association. Josh Johnston is their point of contact out of Connecticut. We're forming within SafeCom and OxCom working group. And I know you've showed the OxCom class. So this is going to be get more of a national attention within SAFECOM and therefore within CISA and the like. Cybersecurity Working Group is going to be coming out with a paper on LMR IP security. As LMR gets enhanced and we move more into the IP realm, enhanced security becomes necessary. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at band 13 and 14 base station issues, high power user equipment and the like. I know, Matt, you're familiar with it. Some issues have uh, come up, and that we're going to be looking at that as well. 
Kid to kid interoperability. What are the standards? We're looking to create them. And who's going to be the gatekeeper as to whether or not a vendor is compliant with the standards? That's something that we're looking at right now. Similar to what we did years ago with the P25 and establishing establishing a standard for phase one and phase two, et cetera. Something that's come up across the country, backing up data. Everybody's gotten whacked or attempted to be whacked by data breaches. So in public safety, what are the best dates, days, and times in the public safety environment to back up and safeguard data? Our cyber group will be coming out with paper on that as well. It's not a mandated thing. It's just certain communities need guidance. Other communities don't. Now, something that I brought up before, it's not good news. We have this SafeCub National Survey. You know, you've seen it, Mark. It's been extended now till September 29th. The responses have not been good. If the gap analysis can't be done, grant money will be affected. Just that simple. For New York State, local response has been 1.9%. If you include those who started and stopped at another 3.3%, you've got a maximum as of the 29th of July of 5.2% of all local emergency communications entities having started or completed a response. The state's a little bit better with 13.6%, with 1.8 in progress to 15.4%. The federal agencies within New York State are only at 2.8%, with nothing in progress. Breaking it down by discipline, the ECCs are at 10.8%, with another 12% in progress. Leading the pack is emergency management, with 18.4%, with 22% in progress. EMS is at 2.8%, with 3.3% in progress, for a total possibility as of the 29th of 6.1%. Fire, 1.3% have completed with another 2.7% in progress. The most we can looking at right now is a total of 4%. And law enforcement, 2.1% have completed with 3.3% in progress for 5.4% in total. Now, the surveys went out both by email and snail mail. There was a problem with some of the addresses. We know that with either raw numbers, however, there is a generic QR code that you can click on and it brings you to the survey. I will forward that code to Matt. Anybody who needs that code, who hasn't gotten the survey and wants to complete it, contact Matt. He will give you the generic code. With every agency that got an invitation, got a specific code. So that's where that uh, problem lies. Nationally, it's no better. The thing is, every five years, we have to do a gap analysis for Congress. The grant guidance is based on the needs established in the gap analysis. 
If we can't provide a good analysis, you may seek grant guidance for horse to horse communications or horse to patrol dog communications, something that nobody's looking for. But we need the material to go to Congress with. And last but not least, since Chris Tuttle's not here, CISA and emergency communications is still undergoing reorganization. Hopefully by December, we will able to be able to put out a new org chart. For those people who aren't familiar with SAFECOM, SAFECOM is established independently by federal law. We're affiliated with CISA and ECD. They do not control us. They do not control our agenda. They fund us. And there's funding that's in the budget from Congress. If you have something that you want brought back and you don't want to make it official, tell me about it. Those of you who know me know I'm not a diplomat. I'll say it as it has to be said. I mean, the survey we're doing, and I'll be perfectly honest, didn't go out the way I wanted it to. They didn't want to, I got outvoted, to be perfectly honest. I wanted to go out with a carrot and a stick. No participation, no grant money. But I couldn't get the people to go along with that. So that's where we stand. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions, either publicly here or privately after the meeting. I do have a spreadsheet of New York State of who has, who hasn't, and who is in progress. But I will not make that public. I'm not looking to embarrass anybody. So that's what I have. Director? Ryan, you had a question for me? How long does the survey take to complete? About 35 minutes. Does Do the agencies get any information back from it? Is there anything? You, you talk about the carrot and the stick. Is there something that benefits them in the process? The only thing that benefits the agency is we know afterwards where the gaps are. <clears throat> so if we don't know that there's a gap, we can ask for grants to meet that gap, go into the gap analysis. Anybody who's ever done grants knows when the guidance comes out, and it's no different with the state, you got to feedback what's in the guidance. If you don't feedback what's in the guidance, you're not getting any money. So if you did the problem, if the problem is with people moving towards encryption or P25 phase two, if there's a problem that needs funding, if we don't know about the problem, we can't address it in the grant guidance. And I, I'll bring that up right now. SAFECOM. <coughs> And it's to grant guidance before it gets published. We look at it, we get the draft, and we can modify it. CISO, ECD, actually publishes all communications grants, regardless of which agency is actually doing the funding. More and more have been moved over to CISA from DOJ and, and the like for the funding. Stuff that's critical, I send to Mark. I can't inundate him in emails, so occasionally I shoot him an email that's, that's important, that I think is important. But I, the, the survey is important. If you're looking for grant money, if you've got a problem, let us know about it. Five years ago when it was, you say it's done every five years, right? Yeah. What was the compliance like five years ago? A little bit better. But similar to what we're seeing now. 
a little bit better. But grant money is getting tighter. So the gap analysis is going to become more important. The chair is going to recognize Nicole Erickson from our grants program. Hi, Jay. I just wanted to kind of follow up and just give you a, a perspective. So DHSES, our, our grants unit is the state administrative agency for Homeland Security grant program funds. So that's our state Homeland Security uh, funding as well as our urban area security initiative. So many of the counties do receive an allocation, a set allocation amount. And I will echo your sen sentiment in terms of what those gap analysis does not only from the grant writing perspective, but also the roll up of how we get funding every year. So within the last four funding cycles of SHSP, the state Homeland Security grant program funds, we've received a reduction of $9 million total. UASI funding, the urban area security initiative, so that's city agency, New York City, along with all of the um, by respective uh, regional partners, received a total of $5 million in a uh, in reduction. So you see uh, uh, DHS, you know, is taking a look at all of the data points that are being submitted through different uh, reporting agencies, reporting uh, venues, and SafeCom is certainly one of those for considerations. They're using that data to drive our allocation amount. So it's really important. And we tell all of our grantees that when those surveys come out and when those calls, data calls come out, to complete that, to complete that uh, survey because it's important those components make up how, how New York State receives uh, their allocation amounts every year in the federal guidance. One other thing, and <clears throat> you're asking about prior surveys. In one aspect, this survey is different than every other survey that's ever been done for communications. There are four separate surveys that have gone out. Depending upon your level of government, there was a local survey. Local surveys are counties and below and local authorities. <clears throat> state survey, the state agencies and state authorities like the Bridge Authority or the MTA, et cetera. Then you had a federal survey, the federal agencies and a tribal survey. So the data will be able to be analyzed based on level of government as well, and we've never been able to do that before. Thank you, Jay. Okay, any other questions for Jay? All right, so Jay, send us the link again. We'll send it out again. We did send it out, and I know the 911 coordinator sent it out to their group as well uh, for, for that. I remember seeing that. Um, and I know my local fire department got it in the mail. Uh, so it, it's out there, but we'll try and do a better job, I think. And now you've expressed the reasoning behind it and the concerns, and we can all bring it back to our folks and say, let's get this done. So. Director, if the people don't have, the agency don't have the email, don't have the QR code anymore, Matt will have the generic yeah. code shortly. Yep. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. And uh, we'll reiterate the importance of getting it done. And uh, it doesn't take 30 minutes. It takes a little over an hour. Don't be frustrated, just do it. Well, right. I can't help slow readers. <laughs> the people who do the testing for this, the wage incentive engineering people, said 35 minutes. The OMB RPA people, or, you know, the Paperwork Retirement Act people, said 35 minutes. Okay. But you did it, so. Uh, yeah, it was a little over. Yeah, I mean, we it, maybe because we're a multifaceted agency, so we had a lot of the individual questions. It took us about an hour and 20 minutes. So let me ask you a question. <laughs> I'm a good reader. <laughs> hour and 20 minutes. Did it impact your lunch? No. Okay. <laughs> and it's important enough I would have impacted my lunch. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to old business. Is there any old business? Anybody? Okay, we'll entertain a motion to accept old business. So moved. Motion by Brian LaFleur, seconded. 
Bob Terry. By Bob Terry, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, new business, any new business? I have one thing under new. Um, if anyone has any presentations that they'd like to see, uh, we've been doing this with the state agency working group, our state agency communications committee. See that name change? <laughs> um, and it, it's working out really well. It's opening up some good conversations. There's some good uh, shared services now being looked at uh, between the counties and state agencies as well. Uh, so if anybody has any presenters you'd like to see uh, at our next seat board meeting, please filter that to me and I'll see if we can arrange that. Um, I know cyber is a big topic. That might be something that would be interesting, um, but there's probably some other things out there that, that you folks might be interested. So let us know and we'll see if we can make those arrangements. Anybody have anything else under new? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to accept new. Motion, Mr. Tripp. Second. Second. Greenberg, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, our next uh, meeting will be Wednesday, October 25th here. Uh, is anybody have anything for the good of the order? Everybody having a good summer? <laughs> yes? Okay. All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Lieutenant Morris, seconded by Mr. Terry. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Terry, thank you, everybody. All over the table. Matt, you should have it. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 the